Obviously, today is Mother's Day, and I want to take a look all the way back to the very first mother found in Genesis, her story, her children, her heartbreak, her temptation, her promise, and her hope. You go, we're going to cover all those? Kind of. As far as we know, and I'm going to summarize to begin with, you can turn to Genesis chapter 4 if you have a Bible, Eve began her life as an adult. She was created, mature, gifted, a beautiful woman. In fact, you could probably say of Eve, at that time in her life, she was the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. (laughs) Right? I mean, think about it. No awkward teenage years, no emotional baggage from high school, no weird dates, no parents to blame anything on. She didn't have to deal with siblings, the rivalry, no no brothers, no sisters. Her very first conscious moment seems to be that with God himself guiding her, providing for her, directing her, God giving her literally a marriage made in heaven. This is Eve. Think about it, that first day that Eve is created, God says to her, Eve, there's someone I want you to meet. Wouldn't that be cool if God said that to you about your, hey, there's someone I want you to meet. No online dating site, no awkward blind date with some guy saying, hey, I'll be the one down by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with a fig leaf on, you can, you can see me. <laughs> no, no people trying to set her up with some, their cousin or their nerdy brother who can't get a date. Th- there's no question for Eve like this, I wonder if Adam is the one for me. And later, when the kids would ask, hey, where'd you guys go on your honeymoon? They could say, truthfully, it was paradise. It was like the Garden of Eden. In fact, it was the Garden of Eden. God made Eve and Adam one. They shared a blessed life of kind of an unspoiled paradise together. I mean, think about this. No traffic. No obnoxious neighbors, no masks, in fact, no clothes for that matter, (laughs) no broken bridges. They had an open relationship with God and with each other with no shame, no guilt, no inhibitions. There was work, there was food, there was home, and there was love. This is the first mom, this is her, her life. And then, as we continue to kind of summarize, there was an enemy who came into the garden. You you guys know the story. And the enemy said to Eve, how can you really be sure? How can you know for certain what God has said is true? How can you believe all that stuff? And he would convince her somehow that there was no consequence for doing what you want to do. You you can take that. You can eat that. There's no judgment. There's no reason you should have any kind of fear at all from God. You can be your own master. You can make your own decisions. You can do your own thing. Isn't that what you want? And so Eve believed. She disobeyed. And now her life with Adam became radically and totally different than it was at the beginning. It's kind of like when you become a mom, everything changes. Isn't that right? I mean, I remember when we had our first child, everything changed. Life's more difficult. They're out of the garden. Even the animals that were once tame and 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 
came to Adam so he could name them, now were dangerous and violent and to be suspect. Weeds are popping up in the garden. Working the soil is now hard labor, and, and Adam is all sweaty. He'd never been that way before. And when it came to giving birth to children, Eve knew that this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> They're not even in the garden anymore. Now she also has to adjust to living with a man who has obvious faults, weaknesses, failures, and excuses. Before, it seemed like he was perfect. I'm sure she must have asked Adam, what happened to you? You've changed. And Adam was quick with a response, I think it's your fault that I'm this way. <laughs> this is an amazing story. This is Eve's story. And even though she disobeyed, even though she believed a lie, God did not disown her. He did not abandon her. In fact, he blessed her in chapter 4 and gives her two children. And she becomes the world's first mother. Look at chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived, bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. In the New Living Translation and in the NIV, it says, with the help of the Lord, I've obtained a child, a gift from him. Think about that. The world's first woman, the world's first wife, now becomes the world's first mother. No doctors, no midwives. No YouTube to kind of see how does this work, how do you have a baby, no Google. Adam has no experience, and somehow with the help of God, she gets through the birth. And this little boy in her arms, the world's first baby, she sees him as a gift from God, given to her with the help of the Lord. The Scripture tells us in verse 2 of chapter 4, Then she bore again this time his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So she's pregnant again, has another child, Abel. And, and you think about it this way, at least this time she was prepared. She knew what to expect. So as, as we get to this point, we know that there, there's four people. There's a family, a husband, a wife, two boys, living in a fallen world, a family of four. And, and I want you to listen, I want you to tune in, and I want you to fast forward just a little bit in chapter 4 down to verse 16, where it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain leaves the presence of the Lord. The indication here is this, that even though they are no longer in Eden, no longer in paradise, they still have fellowship with the Lord, because obviously Cain leaves the presence of the Lord. So God was with them in some way, in some avenue of their lives. And Eve could possibly say this, listen, this is no paradise. Maybe you ladies have said this before. This is no paradise, but God is with me. I have a hardworking husband. I have two beautiful sons. Things are not perfect, but they're good. And God is with them. And the story began, continues to move forward. The, the boys grow up, they're toddlers, they're, they're, they're teens, they're young men. I mean, that happens, right, in life? These, these kids grow up, and you are with them all through those different stages, changing diapers, scraped knees, learning how to ride a bike, all the stuff that happens in life. And in Genesis... It says in verse 2, once again, that the two boys now have jobs. 
One's a tiller of a ground. One's a shepherd. They're both hard workers like their dad. They both have their own professions. They're young men now. They're probably, for the most part, getting ready to, to leave the house. And in the process of time, it says in verse 3, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock, of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But then verse 5, he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the obvious question that, that's part of this story is, why does God accept Abel and his offering? And yet the older brother, Cain, he doesn't accept his. And, and we see in verse 6 that, that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, well, sin lies at the door or crouches at the door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Now, now let me have your attention. Please tune in. This is not some kind of divine predestination where God has decided, well, I'm going to accept this person, but I've also decided not to accept that person. It's not like God says, well, I've chosen long before, and he's in, and you're not in. That's not what the Bible's saying. This would be a complete misunderstanding of what it says. He says, there is a way for you, Cain, that you can be made right. In fact, the Scripture tells us over and over again that God is not willing that any should perish, that God so loves the world. If anyone come to me, he says, or if anyone hears me knocking and will open the door, anyone, he says. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, we have this verse that says, By faith, Abel, we're going back to our story, but now we're in the New Testament, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, he still speaks. Abel still speaks about faith. We, we always want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. That, that's one of the main premises of, of being able to, to balance out what the Bible says if it's not clear in one part, generally it might be made clear in another part of Scripture. So Hebrews 11 makes it very clear that the difference, and here's the difference between Cain and Abel's sacrifice. It's not that God likes shepherds more than farmers. The difference was Abel offered his by faith. So we have to say, well, what, John, what is faith? What's it look like? What's it look like here in this passage of Genesis? Well, faith means to believe. Faith means to trust. To trust what God has said. To trust what God has revealed. To trust what God has done. That's faith. In Romans chapter 4, verse 3, for what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He trusted what God said. He, he followed what God did. See, I believe God had said or revealed to the very first family, the first mom, the first dad, what later he revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, and what he revealed all through the Old Testament, and finally and completely in the person of Jesus Christ. And here's what I think it is. That people in a fallen world, like Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, must come to him through a sacrifice. The laying down of a life. 
This principle runs powerfully all through the Bible. Many have described it as the, the scarlet thread of blood that runs really from the Garden of Eden all the way to the time of Jesus. I think that Abel believed this and Cain did not. Abel had faith to believe what God had instituted through sacrifices is what he required. Cain thought he could do it his own way. Many scholars believe that most likely God began with Adam and Eve on the very first day that they disobeyed. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we have this verse, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. You, you know this story. They realized they were naked, they were ashamed, and you can't make clothes from animal skins without the death of an animal. So many scholars believe that this was the very first animal sacrifice, and that, that somehow, even though it's not described in Genesis, that, that Adam had taught his sons this principle, and that Eve and Adam practiced it. So death came into the world on the day of the first sin, but God, who is gracious and merciful, didn't take the physical life of Adam and Eve, but substitute an animal who was given in their place and clothed them with the skins. So the family knew that the people in the fallen world can only come to God through a sacrifice in which the life is given on their behalf. God made it clear. And so Adam and Eve, I think they probably made sacrifices in the garden. That's why Abel came with one. God was showing how he would deal with disobedience of, of our lives and our sin, the giving of the life of a sacrifice on behalf of sinners by which we may come to him through faith on the basis, well, for you and I, on the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God which was shed for all of us. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, well, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let me have your attention. Cain believed in God. But he didn't think he needed to do a sacrifice for his sins. He came to worship. He, he, he believed. He gave an offering. And God even spoke to Cain personally. It wasn't like he didn't know him. There in Genesis chapter 4, it says, So the Lord said to Cain, verse 6, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not? Be accepted. If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. It's desire for you, but you shall rule over it. Obviously, he felt like, I don't need to do this sacrifice thing. Maybe it's the older brother syndrome. I'm the older brother. I'll do whatever I want to do. I'm, I'm better. I'm different. I'm a leader. Cain chose to come his own way. And then God gave him a chance to do it his way. A lot of people like Cain, listen, they know God is real. They may even sense his presence in their life. They may even know the Bible and what it says, but they don't think they need forgiveness. They don't think they need to come by Jesus. Maybe they're good people. Maybe they're better than a lot of other people. Maybe they're even their own brother or their own sister. This is a prominent idea in our culture. I can do my own thing with God. There's more than one way. God is loving, he's good, he's acceptable, and I can choose and figure it out and understand this relationship, and I'll come to God the way I want to come to God, and I'll live the way I want to live before God. I'm free, so I'll do it this way. But there is a passage in Scripture Romans chapter 14, I mean Proverbs chapter 14, 
says, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. This is the story of Cain. I'll do my own thing. And very soon after the fall, we have the very first religious split on the face of the earth. One chooses a way of obedience to God's word. The other chooses the way of self. I'll do it my way. God should accept me. He should accept what I have to offer. And I'm going to choose to come to him this way. And God is saying, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If, if you do what's right, if you do it my way, what I've revealed, I know it's best for you, Cain. Accept the fact that you're not only a created being blessed by God, but also a fallen person in need of forgiveness by God. Come to me, Cain. This is what God says to him. Come to me, Cain. In a way I have made for you, come to me, he says, the right way, and you will be accepted. That's still his message. Come to me. Cain would not. He was independent. He was stubborn. He was strong-willed. Any of you moms have a child like that who's independent, strong-willed, stubborn? The first mom had her hands full. And it says Cain was angry. Why are you so angry? Why is your countenance fall? See, he's not only angry, but with his emotions ruling, with his angers leading, With his feelings driving him, he becomes very vulnerable to the enemy. In fact, the Lord tells him, in this state of mind, the way you're responding, sin is crouching at the door. Look what it says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? But sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. Strong-willed, hot temper. He's falling into this this, this angry, deceptive, destructive, deadly situation. In fact, did you know that when it says here, if if you do not do well, sin lies at the door? This is the first time in the Bible that the word sin is even used. It's coming after you, he says. It wants to control you. It's crouching at the door. The image is like a wild animal that's outside your door. It's crouching, ready to pounce on you. If you open the door, it's it's ready to overpower you and bring destruction to you. And here's what God is saying to Cain and possibly to you and I. Sin wants to get its claws in you. And if you're being led by your feelings, by your emotions, by your temper, by being stubborn, by being proud, it'll drag you into deception and disbelief and into destruction. You're turning away from what I've revealed to you, God says. You're demanding your own way. Sin with its power is at work, and if you must, you must yourself fight it. It says you have to overpower it. If you don't, it'll destroy you. In James chapter 4, we have this verse, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. This is what he's saying to Cain. Submit to me. Draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. I'll cleanse you. I'll I'll purify you. You can't be this double-minded person. In John chapter 10, verse 10, We have another verse that says, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. Listen, let me have your attention. There with the first mom and the first dad and the first two sons, the enemy comes and he wants to kill, he wants to destroy, he wants to tear the family apart, he wants to rip Cain off. And that's what the enemy does. Ask any alcoholic. Ask any drug addict. Ask any sex addict. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers, against the rulers and the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Here, see, let me have your attention. The problem that Cain has, it's not with Abel. It's really not with God. It's with himself. He's his problem. He's proud. He's stubborn. He's hot-tempered. He wants to do it his own way. God speaks to him. He says, look, 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 whoa, calm down. There's a way for you to be accepted. There's a battle you've got to fight. Cain doesn't want to hear it. He's not listening. He's thinking, that, that's for my younger brother. He can come that way if he wants to make a sacrifice. That's for Abel. He needs, he's weak, he's needy. I'm not. So Cain's anger grows. His embarrassment, his little brother had done something better than him. He's resented his brother. So one day, alone in the field there in verse 8, now Cain talked with Abel. It must have been some talk, huh? I think it's a little more than he just talked to him. You ever had your older brother just talk to you? He talked to him. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and, and he killed him. Talk about heartbreak. Eve loses her son, her secondborn, at the hands of her firstborn. I mean, talk about the broken heart of a mom. And then if we go back down to verse 16 again, then Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord and dwells somewhere else. Here she is. What's, I mean, what's she going to do? She's lost her firstborn now and her secondborn. One leaves. The other has been killed by her own brother, his own brother. And so what's a mom to do in this situation for the prodigal, for the grief of losing a son? I, I, I had a wedding this weekend. I was doing a wedding over in Pensacola, and I met the brother of the bride, and we were talking. He um, said, you know, I just lost my son. We had the service last Sunday. I said, well, how old was he? He says he was 30 years old, and he just started to cry. And I said, well, you know, I don't think it ever gets back to normal, but I'll pray that every day perhaps gets a little more bearable. Here's Eve. She's in some way lost both her children. One is gone, and the other is far from home. And I, and I want you to hear this. I want you to listen. Sin that crouches at the door through feelings, emotions, through disobeying God's way, through saying, I'll do it my own way, results in all kinds of brokenness. Not, not only in the life of Adam and of Eve, but look at the impact on families today. People probably here today who have lost sons and daughters to anger, to rebellion, to doing it my way. Mom, dad, I'm not going to live by your rules. No respect for authority like Cain. No respect for truth. Don't care what God thinks. Don't bring brings about an enormous amount of brokenness and separation in families. And, and this, is, this is the heartbreak of Eve in, in the very first story of the first mom and the first family on the face of the earth. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is difficult. Where, where does Eve go with a broken heart? So that's what she has. God had given a promise, even as they were leaving the garden, when he spoke to the enemy in chapter 3, verse 15, if you have your Bible, he talks to the serpent and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, Eve, between your seed and her seed. It'll bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. She doesn't completely understand that yet, but the serpent, the enemy, and you know the story, and this is what it's really like, the enemy knows what God has said. Well, her seed's going to bruise my head. And he tries to make her his friend. 
his accomplice, part of his plan. But God says, I'll make her your enemy. God, God spoke to the woman's offspring. You have brought her downfall, but her offspring will bring your destruction. God gave Eve a promise here before this all happens that, that evil will not have the last word. The enemy will not have the last word. So you sitting here today, you might say, well, John, how do I apply this to my life? For moms, for, for dads, for sons, for, for, for daughters. Well, num number one, I would say this. They all come from a family, and we all have an enemy to fight. We all do. And we all have a promise to believe. If you go back to verse 7 of chapter 4, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, then you're vulnerable to this destructive power that crouches at the door. If you do not recognize it and fight against it, if you don't resist, if you don't ask for the Lord's help and come to Him according to His way, you can rule over sin and temptation, but it also can rule over you. So how do we fight the enemy? Well, we, we must decide to come to God based on His way, His word, not ours. Faith believes what God has revealed, what God has said. Faith believes what God has revealed, what God has said. And God has revealed that we come to him on the basis of a sacrifice offered once and for all through the person, through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. And everyone has to choose personally. Cain's way was to come how he chose. God will accept it. Well, God did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. See, today I'm, I'm asking moms, I'm, I'm asking dads, sons, daughters, to not believe the lie that people can come to God any way they so choose. From the very beginning, it was tried. A lot of people believe God, but believe they can do and live and do and come to Him any way they want. The, the world thinks that, and they might get even angry at you for saying, no, you can't, just like Cain. Better to be rejected by Cain and accepted by God than to be accepted by Cain and rejected by God, right? Mom, if you want to have a godly influence... You have to have this truth settled in your life, in your home, that Jesus is God's way to be forgiven and accepted. And share it with your kids. T temptation comes. It, it crouches at the door. You, you have to resist it. In Romans chapter 8, verse 13, we have this verse, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See, here's the story. Your story, my story, Eve's story, Adam's story. When God comes to us when we failed, when we've fallen, he invites us to confess, to, to be forgiven, to be back in relationship. When, when, when Adam and Eve blew it, God came looking for them. In chapter 3, verse, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord. They had disobeyed. They had fallen. They heard the sound of the Lord, verse 8, chapter 3, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam, and he said to him, Where are you? Listen, they had fallen. They had blown it. They had done the one thing God told them not to do, and God doesn't disown them. He doesn't turn his back on them. God comes looking for them. And he says, hey, where are you? And it's not like God didn't know where they are, right? It's not like God's going, man, I wonder where the only two on the earth could be. <laughs> are they in that cave over there? Do they have a little reed? Are they under the water? You know, like, where are those guys? No, it's an invitation that God's giving. 
He's, he's, he's asking them to choose. Come out out in the open, he says. Come out and confess to me. Be clean. Tell me what you did. Not like I'm going to smash you when you do. He does the same thing with Cain. Hey, there's a way. There's still a chance. If you do it the right way, you can be accepted. In fact, he even comes to him again after he kills his brother in chapter 4, verse 9. The Lord said to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? It's not like God didn't know that the only other sibling on the face of the earth had been killed by his own brother. It's not like God didn't know this. He knows everything, but he's giving him a chance. Hey, come on out in the open. Come out and confess. T tell me what you've done wrong. This is, this is the way that God works. He's not coming to you with an iron fist or angry. Or He said, hey, hey what, what, what are you doing? You can still be accepted. This is the invitation to confess and tell the truth. Adam, where are you? Cain, where's your brother? He responds, am I my brother's keeper? It's only then that God confronts him. God always comes first with grace and mercy and opportunity to do right. See, here's the deal. You know this, I'm sure. If you don't, you should. That you can tell God the truth about you because he already knows. He already knows what you do in the dark. He already knows what you do that others don't. God already knows. And when he comes to you and says, hey, sin's crouching at the door. You want to deal with it? I don't have any problems. Really? Where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? He has a heart for you. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you with the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed for all of us. We're all in the same boat. See, here's the thing. Moms, dads, you have a promise to believe. It would have been easy for Eve, I think, to give up, to be discouraged, to become a couch potato, to say, you know what? I'm just going to blame God. I, I, I've lost my only child, my only son. My, my firstborn is, is gone. My secondborn is dead. She could have blamed herself. I should have been a better mom. I should have done it this way. All my work, all my sacrifice, all those labors with diapers and scraped knees, up all night when they're sick. What for? God, God where are you now? They're gone. And I think he believed this promise. She didn't give up. She had hope even in her grief, even in her loss. And at the end of chapter 4, we have this wonderful last couple of verses. We'll close with this. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed, she says. He's given me another son. As for Seth, to him also a son was born, verse 26. And he named him Enosh. Oh, whoa. He's a grandmother. She not only gets another son, but eventually she gets a grandson. The men began to call on the name of the Lord. And the Lord's turning the family around. God gives her another son, and he's walking with the Lord. And if you go with me to the last verses we'll look at, turn all the way over to the New Testament, Luke chapter 3. You can do this. You, you can do this. We're almost finished. Luke chapter 3, where it gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It starts in verse 23 of Luke chapter 3, and it goes all the way through those people that the line of Jesus comes through. Starts at verse 23, and then it ends at verse 38. And it says, the son of Enosh, who was the son of Theth, Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. This third son she has ends up being the line from which Jesus Christ himself comes. God gives her this enormous heritage 
and these children and grandchildren, now Eve's a grandmother, and this terrible chapter where all the heartbreak and all the difficulties come ends with then these men began to call on the name of the Lord. I mean, how many moms or grandmothers have said, you know, what's the future going to be like for my kids, for my grandkids? Well, I believe Eve prayed. She believed in the Lord. And I want you to hear this, moms. God has the final word, not the enemy. Be a praying mom. Be a, be a mom who tells the truth about what God's revealed. Eve didn't know the name of Jesus, but she knew the promise that would come. And he did come. He came through, through Eve's son and through her grandsons in that one and the next one and the next one and the next one. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and he defeated the enemy and he is the Savior. Mom, dad, daughter, son, you have an enemy to fight, a promise to believe, and you can put your trust in him. You can give your life to him. He knows everything about you. And over and over again, he'll give you the opportunity to come out into the open. Don't be ruled by your stubbornness or your temper or your feelings or your emotions, but by the truth that God has revealed to you. And let him come to you and say, hey, what's going on? Why are you hiding? Where's your brother? What are you up to? If you will, you can be accepted by me. That's his open arms. That's his promise. And on this Mother's Day, as we listen to the story of the very first mother, we see it end in a way of great hope, great promise, and great love as God gives her this, this son and this ultimate lineage of the greatest gift that God ever gave to the earth, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And I just close with this. Happy Mother's Day because God is a wonderful good God who has given to us through the first mother, our son, Jesus Christ. Amen?